Okay, well, let's, uh, let's kick off, guys. Um, Cellmarks.com. Thank you for coming to the panel session, guys. Um, we've got uh, uh, an enormous audience here, Mark. Ooh. We've got an enormous... I'll, I'll turn this one away. We've got an enormous audience here. It's feeding back, is it? Panama. I'll tell you what, then why don't we do this? Let's see if this works. Can you pass this between you? Final tweaks on the sound level here. It's a good proof of concept. Brand new, I picked it. <laughs> if it fails, it's on me. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's just assume it's working and we can assume that the skilled engineers at the back can fix any nits as we go along. So, cellmarks.com, thank you very much for coming um, to our hugely packed room here. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to see so many of you have turned up. It is the end of a very good um, but quite hot and tiring conference, so uh, I'm, I'm not surprised a few people have sidled off for a train here. Cellmarks.com is, uh, is proud to be the diamond sponsor of Streaming Forum this year. Um, we took it as an opportunity to raise profile of, uh, of ourselves and what we're about. Um, We've subtitled uh, cellmarks.com the uh, multi-tool reference for those trying to get a video signal back to base on an ad hoc basis. Uh, Michael, who is at the back of the room here, is our operation and day-to-day -day editor uh, for cellmarks.com and uh, he, is, uh, he is the point of contact for, uh, for, for those of you who are interested in, in the products that we list. The aim of the site, I've been writing for several years for Streaming Media Magazine, well, 12 years about a wide variety of subjects, but in the last uh, three or four years, the uh, portable backpack units and portable um, compact units which you can plug multiple SIM cards into to create a, a single high bandwidth connection over a cellular network which you can use for live video backhaul. Um, I've been reviewing m several of these different vendors and they're very geographically dispersed and I've been increasingly asked for my opinion uh, to compare the different technology types. Um, and so we thought we'd pull together cellmarks.com as a sort of uh, Swiss army knife for people in the field who are trying to get in touch with the community to ask questions about how to use cellmarks, how to use different techniques to get video back to base. Um, we have a sort of men membership scheme uh, where the, the vendors basically just give us a little bit of turnover cash so that we can keep the whole site running. We aggregate their news. We don't publish any editorial on the site purposefully so that we don't tread on the toes of my friends in streaming media, but also it gives us the ability to link out to streaming media and other, um, and other, uh, and other uh, magazines to find out, um, sorry, to, 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 to aggregate those links into the product listings on the cellmarks.com website and be happy to give you a little tour of the site on, on the cellmarks stand in the, uh, in the exhibition space if you haven't seen it already. We also aim to have forums. It's a geeks, geeks get together. It's an online club for people who are interested in this space. There isn't currently an electronic news gathering magazine or an outside broadcast magazine. There isn't a hub for people to get together and be able to just communicate. We're not really trying to be a massive commercial venture. It's, it's a get together point. So hopefully if you haven't already, please sign up onto cellmarks.com. And those of you who are watching online, we've got a, uh, 120 or so registrations out there. Uh, thanks, I'm not sure which camera to look at, but it's good to have you with us. So, one of the parts of the, uh, of the project is to hold a monthly or, or re around about monthly Google Hangout or something like that with the different vendors so that you can get a chance to talk to them about their products, talk to them about how to use the products better and just have some interface. Uh, and to start the show, I couldn't choose any one of the members or the vendors to, uh, to, to, uh, to kick the project off. I didn't think it was fair to start with, uh, with any particular one vendor. And so I, um, I turned the screws on these fine gentlemen here who actually know an awful lot more than I do about backhaul and about live links. Um, and uh, so this inaugural panel session is really to get a high level view about the changing landscape of news gathering and outside broadcast. Uh, we're gonna look at um, news gathering workflows as they have been over, uh, up until now. Uh, we're gonna look at the key performance indicators on those live links a little bit, technology options, that they have in the core, uh, and we're going to look at technology options at the edge, which obviously will then embrace the Cellmux family. Um, so I want to take, over, overall through this conversation discussion, I want to take a look at how 
uh, how IP and IP streaming technologies are disrupting and changing that news gathering workflow and that outside broadcast workflow. And there are probably no better people in this country uh, than, th than these three gentlemen and Mark, who is uh, in, currently in Times Square in New York, um, to, uh, to talk to us about, the, about that news gathering workflow. So, um, guys, I'd like to ask you left to right to uh, introduce, well, left to right and virtually to introduce yourselves. Mark, we'll come to you on uh, 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 number four in a second. So, Colin, could you, uh, could you give us a little bit of an introduction about your role and, uh, and your sort of interest in this space? I think we're going to guess with the microphones a little bit. I think it works. Um, my name's Colin Muir. I'm the news gathering technology lead for BBC Scotland, um, and I'm currently responsible for a... Uh, a fleet of seven IP satellite vehicles and a growing number of uh, mobile bonding units or uh, wireless multiplexers, as I Dom, Dom has been describing it, and it's really changing the way that we're able to uh, cover cover the live news. Uh, my name is Guy Pelham. Up until the uh, back end of last year, I was live editor for BBC News, uh, and that really meant my job was to look at innovative ways of uh, covering stories live and uh, upload uh, over uh, around the UK and, and internationally as well. Um, so that led me into uh, IP news gathering and uh, most particularly uh, the use of VSAT and bonding technology. Richard. My name is Richard Westwood. I work for Sky News in London. Uh, my title is Head of Links, which actually is very vague and just involves um, connectivity. So I look after how we get content into Sky uh, whether it be IP or more traditional methods. But more recently, we've been looking at, obviously, working with KA and 3G, 4G bonding devices extensively. And uh, Mark? Find out how the delay works. Yes, uh, this is Mark Lacquet. I'm at, uh, at Thomson Reuters in New York. <laughs> and the, uh, my role is really on a technology level for production, post-production, contribution, and I contribute as well to certain the digital platforms that we have uh, through the different products, B2B and business to consumer products that uh, Thompson Reuters has on a global basis. Brilliant. So let's talk about, first of all, about news gathering workflows as they've evolved. Um, Colin and Guy, I, I, I think I probably need to talk to you collectively a little bit because you probably both share, uh, share, share a company that you've been involved with a lot. So could you tell us a little bit about the typical BBC news, news gathering workflows as they have been? Um, historically, I think they're pretty much the same as everybody else's um, up until not very long ago. Um, the, if you're uh, talking about television, the only way you went live is if you had a, uh, uh, an SNG vehicle. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, there were terrestrial links and, and, and one or two other things, but essentially that was the main weapon of choice for, uh, for any um, broadcaster, not just the BBC. And, and I think um, what's happened in the last sort of five years, six years maybe, is that that situation has transformed itself and there are now many different ways of, of going live, not all of which work uh, on every occasion, they're not, uh, you know, you wouldn't necessarily uh, use, um, a, a, you know, a bonding backpack, for example, to cover, you know, a multi-cam, multi-camera, multi-path story. You wouldn't. But the, the, I suppose the point is now you have any uh, news organisation has a much wider range of tools to cover uh, any story you care to mention. And it's not always one size fits all SNG. So, did uh, technology have technologies such as microwave and began and so on um, played into that scope uh, uh, as we've been doing the transition? I mean, began did, yeah. I mean, there was a sort of a bit of a began revolution uh, in in international news gathering, particularly um, about what eight years ago, something like that. Yeah. was when it came on uh, when the first generation of began uh, uh, antennas came on the market, and I think that really did transform what people could do live from um, difficult parts of the world. They were very portable um, and okay the bandwidth was a bit low and the picture quality was a bit mm, um, but um, it, it allowed you to go live from places that you could never go to, uh, you could never have gone to before. So uh, in, in some ways I think that was the sort of the, the, the precursor of, of what, what, where we are now. It was small, it was light, it was flexible. It wasn't particularly cheap 
I mean, you know, if you do a day's worth of streaming over BGAN, your finance department knows about it quite quickly. Um, but uh, but it, 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 it did transform what, what broadcasters were able to do. And Richard, is the, is the Sky workflow always going to be identical or broadcaster generically going to use identical workflows or do you have nuances that you're aware of? No, no. <clears throat> I mean, believe it or not, BBC Sky and ITN actually work very closely together. Um, we talk to each other. <laughs> you know, we, see what, we see what, you, what, what each other are doing and, and, and you follow. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the workflow is very similar, you know, and SNG was the de facto. Um, obviously, you fixed to structure fiber networks for, you know, places you do day in, day out. As Guy said, the BGAN transformed international news because you can literally take that anywhere. And it was the, the forerunner of what we're, you know, what we're now seeing with 3G, 4G bonding devices, um, Wi-Fi connectivity, even the humble iPhone. You know, there's an app on there that we can use that we can stream live video to where. And Mark, uh, I will have to sort of uh, to allow for a little bit of latency, but Mark, uh, in the Reuters model, you're obviously more of a news agency providing news into, uh, into broadcasters internationally. Uh, do you face specific challenges in your own uh, news gathering and news aggregation workflow uh, that might be specific to being an agency as opposed to being a director or broadcaster? part that uh, we address uh, almost on a daily basis is the, the, the part where the, the reporter, the journalist is in the field in a hostile environment. So those, those situations are the ones where you, you need to be really agile and uh, we've seen uh, all these technologies being used that we use the began and we use uh, streaming technologies uh, with cellular bonding. Now, obviously there's regions that's uh, more difficult than others. Uh, we do the story forward in, in such cases as well. But, we, it's really an evolution. When, when you go back to the began uh, phone or uh, transmission mechanism, and you look at what you're able to do today and, and the mobility that you achieve with, with those systems that is fit in a pocket or in a, uh, a suitcase, it's really uh, it's really something that has helped us cover areas of the world that otherwise would be a, a lot more difficult. And we, we do have uh, trucks here and there, but uh, it's not it's not something that now we rely on uh, on all areas for uh, for news coverage. So it's a it's a major advantage now to have something lightweight and easy to carry around. So until the advent of IP in the uh, Reuters analogy or the Reuters model, I presume it was quite difficult to find a consistent type of network technology that was available globally and you would end up with different types of workflow for different regions or different, d different nuances in the satellite providers for regions. Is that, is that correct? We do have uh, some uh, challenge. I mean, it's, it still hits us. Like we, uh, we, we, we use like SIM cards and obviously the, uh, those, those packs that we have uh, or, or, or broadcast kits that we want to uh, use in different parts of the world, they end up being, uh, some of them centralized in certain areas and they're being shipped to, uh, to cover certain events in the world. And then we end up with those situations where the, the hitting the ground running is, uh, is where, what we want to be able to do. So I read the, 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 the kit arrives in a country and it's immediately uh, recognizing the cellular network in that country. So because you have the proper SIM cards uh, loaded. The, uh, I have to say, at the beginning, there's, there's been some struggle in certain countries where the, this is not something that you, 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 uh, you expect and, and necessarily prepare for, but then you, you have all these uh, surprises when you get there. But it's a, it, it's, it's a learning process that we went through, and now it's a, it's a lot easier. We know how to get into a country without uh, having to uh, uh, go to a local store to buy SIM cards. And Colin, um how responsive does your team have to be? How much notice do you typically get? Uh, obviously, for the crashes and the disasters, you probably don't get much notice. But for other events where you're going to take, this, take your outside broadcast technology to the field, how responsive can you be? And, and, and is that changing as well? Um, well, I mean, in, in the past, um, if, we, uh, if we were planning an event, we, we would have to allocate one of our uh one of only a handful of uh, satellite trucks. I mean, um, traditionally speaking, um, our, our KU-based uh, Lynx vehicles would be very, are very expensive. 
and, and really what, what we, we've seen with the availability of um, ubiquitous um, IP um, it, it is ultimately that the, the, we can scale things up at a much much reduced cost and we can actually take our newsroom out of out of the central belt in, in, in Scotland and actually start moving out to, to the areas where, where uh, traditionally it would be very hard to actually cover so I mean, we're actually able to uh, deploy a a KA-based uh, satellite vehicle to you know, the Highlands or the Islands, and we, we get good, good, uh, high, high bit rate uh, upload and download, and it means that you know, all of our editing, all of our shooting, can be done on location and filed back in, in the same day. Um, it, and also, if we are, uh, you know, if we are covering a, f a festival um, or, or, or the like, you know, we are actually able to take a, a very, very lightweight piece of kit, um, put it on the top of, a, of the roof of the port cabin or on top of a vehicle, and, and we, we have. A, High, high bit rate uh, uh, live streaming capability as, as well as uh, office based uh, connectivity in, 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 in the one unit and in fact that's uh, something that we did to uh, great success at the, uh, the Hay Festival recently um, where we're actually um, able to, to, to take that approach and actually start doing all of um, the live broadcasts from, from location over IP rather than actually uploading um, and downlinking and then putting, putting back out so we're actually straight to web rather than um, uh, back to our, uh, our MCRs. So let's touch on video quality. Um, I remember when I started webcasting in 96, 97, and the, I was kind of using one by one pixel quality video. Uh, the, the very idea that that would ever meet broadcast was kind of ridiculed. Um, Guy, you've probably had a, a, a couple of years longer than myself in the, um, in the space. Um, broadcasters have, uh, I think, have traditionally been in the sort of hi-fi end of the, uh, of the market, expecting extremely high quality. As we've moved to through through the began market, perhaps, but as we've moved to these more um, edgy technologies, when has good enough become good enough? What's what are the kind of uh, breakpoints, or have you have you received feeds that you've refused as a live editor? Um, I think the the way to answer that question is it, it depend, The audiences now are much more forgiving of quality, um, video quality. Um, when they understand the reason for it. Um, so they know that if you're uh, in the middle of nowhere, the video quality may not be that great. They, if they know that if it's a breaking story um, and you're maybe, as, as Richard said, you're going live off a smartphone uh, as first response, um, they, they understand that. Um, uh, I think where perhaps they, they run into uh, more difficulties are where th uh, the, the quality is poor for no very obvious reason. So, you know, if you're standing in Downing Street doing a two-way and the quality is rubbish, then the, the, uh, the BBC viewer might say, well, why am I paying my licence fee? Um, um, so, uh, but I think audiences are much more sophisticated uh, about, um, you know, what they watch and how they watch it. And they don't insist on um, something, you know, wonderfully HD on every, absolutely every occasion. I think they expect their studio uh, shot to look good. I mean, they expect that to be good and, and, and HD capable. But, um, you know, I think we're also not just talking about broadcasters here. We're t uh, traditional broadcasters. There are plenty of other organisations um, that are now becoming media organisations, newspapers, online digital news providers. And, um, you know, they're embracing whole different sets of audiences and, and they have different views again about what they expect in terms of quality. Um, you know, if, if, if you're able to stream uh, really good, effective uh, news content uh, onto, onto the web, then uh, people, you know, will watch it. Um, in, in Ukraine, for example, um, there's a, a, an organisation uh, which composed of a number of uh, uh, journalists who previously worked for other media organisations in Ukraine and essentially set up their own news service and they were streaming uh, really good uh, news content. It wasn't particularly great quality, um, but it was, it was valid and it was watched uh, and it was appreciated by an audience that wasn't getting news from uh, many other sources. So, you know, uh, I, I think uh, it's not quite as straightforward as it used to be. Broadcasters, yeah, used to be dead picky, but they're not anymore. And Richard, do you remember? The, uh, uh, there must be a story to tell about the first time one of your uh, one of your editors or one of your news crews asked you to provision a cost-effective IP link as opposed to a high-quality fibre or something like that. Was there a particular point where that started to 
uh, to happen, or do you still sort of defer, if you possibly can, to the higher quality, regardless of the cost? Strangely enough, <coughs> for Sky News, it was the actually the transition from SD to HD. Um, when uh, the news channel was looking to go HD back in 2010, uh, we then had to look at how we deliver content contribution-wise and how we could make the transition and actually get HD instead of SD. And funnily enough, it was that that started us to look at the IP delivery. And from very early on, it became obvious that uh, streaming video over an IP network was actually a cheaper option than the traditional SD fibre. Because of the compression? And no, no not, not just the compression, because you're actually streaming video over an IP network, so you're leasing a data network rather than buying into a point-to-point -point dedicated mm. fibre. Um, so you end up taking on far more of the management of the hardware you're using, but it means you can set the level of the quality, um, depending on the bandwidth. Um, so it, it was actually the transition from SD to HD that forces us to look at you know, new ways of bringing content in. And Mark, um, I think the, 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 the gap between my question and your response will sort of highlight the, it will, it will emphasize the, uh, the point of the question. Latency, uh, IP tends to introduce latency, not always, but broadly speaking, IP tends to introduce latency. Um, has that been a complication to manage in terms of synchronizing uh, in the playouts and so on and so forth, or, or are there mitigating techniques now that allow you to, uh, to manage latency in the production environment? Two, three, four. It really depends on, on the assignment. So uh, we have we have some sort of a, uh, a in, in the assignment the original assignment for the, the the person to go out and do the the event. Uh, obviously, it's most of the time it's a say one man uh, band and uh, with one camera. In those type of events, in the coordination part of it, we will discuss the who's the customer, what's the where's that content going. And we will adjust our uh, system to to basically cater to those those uh, uh, customers. So you can have an event that requires the a high quality and will would not mind the 10, 12 seconds latency. And but at the same time, we have journalists that we can take that signal to, and the the, the text journalists would create snaps out of those uh, those live feeds. So they will rather have a lower quality, but if at, a, at a smaller latent latency, so that the the snaps that they are generating out of the of what the person is saying is obviously more uh, timely. So we um, we basically cover that in the assignment phase, where we we basically. Uh, know what kind of a quality ratio versus the latency that we're going to uh, be broadcasting or, or streaming that, that event. Uh, later on, if, if the event is streamed in a, in a low latency, lower quality, well, we always have the opportunity to bring the recorded version from the field into the station and then ingest that content uh, on a, on a, for post-production purposes or reposting as a on-demand clip, those kind of things. So we, we, we tune it depending on the, our internal audience, essentially. And I think it would be true to say that actually the latency that we're experiencing here is quite a lot worse than we probably get on a, on a, on a news link. Interesting. Um, I mean, that's... You know, About three seconds. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the latency is adjustable. On most of the bonding devices, you, you adjust the latency depending on what you're actually trying to achieve. So for a live two-way contribution link, we will often sacrifice quality to reduce the latency to the bare minimum. Mm. And then if they want to, uh, I don't know, do some content feeding, if we, if, we, if we haven't got time to wait to storm forward, then we'll increase latency to you know, 12, 15, 20 seconds to in improve the quality to get a clip in and then FTP the material in full HD later. So an interesting question, something I've, I've, I, it's an opportunity for me to ask because I, I, I've not asked this before, but time stamping and synchronization, gen locking and so on within this environment, within IP, that must be quite a complex challenge. Lip sync is, has proved to be one of the issues. I think we've all, we've all seen it. Yeah. You, you'll, you know, the stream will start, it, it'll be fine, and then halfway through the, the, the audio sync will just go out and the only way you can get it back is by stop and restart the stream. So it's 
better now than it was, certainly in the early days. I, I mean, when I first started looking at this technology four, four years ago, um, it, you know, it, 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 it's come a long way to, to the point where actually now as, as television audiences, I don't think uh, people will actually notice that we're using this technology. I mean, in, in the past, I could look at a TV screen and I could tell, oh, I'm sitting this guy using um, their supplier today, um, or, or we you know, look at our output, well, we're using that type of codec. But no, it's, it's, I don't think you can tell, and, and the, uh, I mean, we're, we're using it daily now. I mean, uh, for example, uh, from a BBC perspective, all of our US uh, output is over cellular uh, multiplexers. Wow. Um, mm. Or rather, it's the first option now, rather than... First option. Rather than the second option. That's, That's really mean, interesting. It's, it's, really, it's really changed the way that we, as an organization, we can, uh, we can actually operate. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, as an example there, um, Hurricane Sandy, um, which um, hit the US um, a, a year or two back, um, I think the, the, it would be fair to say about 80% of the BBC's live coverage of that storm and its aftermath was done on cellular, wow. back, you know, That's on, bonding, staggering, on bonding kit. Um, because, I mean, partly because, uh, I mean, 4G, let's be, let's be honest, 4G in the States changed the game. Um, you know, it, it's it's ubiquitous uh, there, and it and it's and it's very reliable. Um, uh, it also uh, proved the point. Uh, actually, it was remarkably resilient. I mean, normally when you throw a hurricane at uh, at, uh, at telecommunications infrastructure, it, it tends to have a fairly devastating effect. But actually, what we found uh, was that it yes, it did affect things for a, for a, a two or three hours immediately after the storm went through, but it came back up really quickly. And um, the BBC and other broadcasters were able to do a huge amount um, using 4G and using uh, a cellular um, to cover the aftermath of the storm. And the other plus point was, of course, um, those big satellite dishes um, had to come down during, you know, way before the, the storm actually hit because the, uh, you know, the wind speeds would have blown the trucks over or ripped the, ripped the antenna off the roof. So actually you were able to keep broadcasting longer than you would have otherwise. And so, Mark, you must have a, a, an extensive global crew uh, operatives out in the field who are, uh, op who are uh, deploying technologies and so on. Um, is this kit easy to use? Has it become easier to use? Uh, is it a skilled job that you need to, do you need to have fairly high caliber engineers in the field? Or can you have the high caliber engineers in the core and just send out red button technologies at this stage? Wow. Uh, no, I think the, the, the quality at, at the capture is always basically the key. So you, 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 can't, you can't have a, uh, a system that basically lowers that quality and, and basically you're relying on, on people to uh, use that technology the right way and, and to produce the images that you're, uh, that you're expecting from them. What, what we've seen is that the, the quality uh, is, is maintained. I mean, it, it, it could vary because of the individual, but, but at the end of the day, these people are professionals and, and, and uh, do their job the best in the conditions that they are and the, uh, with the equipment that they have. We, uh, our ratio of equipment, though, is that uh, we, we don't have a, a, a large amount of uh, uh, systems that can do live streaming from the field. We are, are, the bulk of our equipment has more to do with re recording, uh, putting on a, on a laptop and in a store forward uh, fashion, because that's the type of business that we're in. But there's, a, there's an increasing kind of ramp up of, of the technology for, for doing live streaming. But the, the market that uh, we're catering to is, is not looking for that like in all cases. So, but the, um, the quality has to be there. So we, we do that through different things, like, like standardizing the kits that are being used, standardizing it on the camera level, those kind of things, standardizing on the, on the codec. And, and obviously, like, like other broadcasters, we, uh, we, we take the content that we have, and sometimes we, we do have harsh conditions to deal with and quality that is not necessarily the best. And sometimes it happens on, on a mobile phone, but this is the image we have, and people understand uh, that this is uh, what's available for that circumstance. I think it's worth saying that actually most of the, certainly the bonding kit, is pretty simple to use. I mean. And it can be made even simpler. I mean, you can uh, you can you can decide uh, how much uh, you're going to allow your people on location to tamper with it. 
um, uh, to, to mess with the settings on location. I mean, I've come across uh, at least one occasion where somebody who's never used one of these backpacks before has gone, has essentially taken it, gone to the location, been talked through it by somebody over there and, and gone on air with it. It's not difficult. Uh, and, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but um, you but know, it's, it's pretty simple. You haven't yet posted kit out to people you've known. Who uh, <laughs> no, but you ship it, and or people will arrive in a country. Uh, you, you know, if if you if you have a story breaking in country X, um, what any of the broadcasters would do is pick up the phone to a provider and say, "Can you give us a, a backpack or a camera back unit?" Um, and the guys will uh, arrive off the plane. Um, they'll, uh, you know, they'll either find the kit waiting for them as they get off the plane or at their hotel, uh, you know, hopefully completely with, complete with sims that are working and, and off they go. Um, easy. And Colin, do you, do, you, do you arm the edge team with, uh, with bonding kit as a resilience and a redundancy op option to say KE, KE, KA type models or, or do you, uh, are, are, are there redundancy is it used as a redundancy strategy, uh, or do you tend to be sending saying, "Look, just go out with this kit"? We we just send them out with the kit. Uh, I mean, I, th I think it's so. Uh, it, the technology has now got to the point where you quite, quite literally um, plug your camera in and switch it on. I mean, I mean, the all, all of the, uh, the, the the key manufacturers in the market, you know, you, you can literally set up their drones to do that, and you can also remotely control them from the MCR end. That that is interesting. Uh, interesting impact on our MCR workflows, uh, which mm. we're not not necessarily read. Ready to uh, to fully adopt, but the you know the it's the simplicity of, of this technology and and, and really it, as Guy says it's the availability of LTE for, uh, you know, high 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 bandwidth um, mobile connections that's re really been the turning point. To, I mean we we deployed we've only got one deployed unit in, in Scotland for, for for news gathering and we we started very slowly. I didn't expect great things, but now, now it's actually our, our main live option in Edinburgh at the moment. Um, one of our vehicles is actually live vehicles is being used for the uh, the Queen's Baton relay um, coverage. And uh, you know, our, our main port of call uh, when a news break news story breaks in Edinburgh is we deploy our uh, our camera back unit, and it's it's working very well. It's, it's surprisingly, I mean, w one of the key things to emphasise is that it, you know it's working now over LTE. But w one of the things that we have to do as as an organise uh, as a Organisation, you know, as an industry, is really start reaching out to the the providers and actually looking to get quality of service, which is 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 possible the possibility with with the availability of LTE um, to actually start guaranteeing that this this stuff is going to work in the future. So, Guy, we touched on this on email before mm. the session on on uh, on the question of the operators' enthusiasm about this type of technology. Uh, and whether there were, whether there was the ability to engage and talk about qu getting cores out of operators and so on, so that you could start doing that, is that something you've already had conversations about? Uh, is that I, I haven't personally, but I know that. Um, uh, well, two things. I mean, one, I know that uh, I think at least one Scandinavian broadcaster has done uh, uh, done a deal with um, uh, with uh, a telco for uh, guaranteed bandwidth. Um, and I think actually these uh, the telcos have bandwidth that they want to sell. Um, I mean, 4G take up in, in some places is not overwhelming um, and they have bandwidth to sell and, um, you know, broadcasters are, are willing, I think, to buy if the price is right. Um, because, as we all know, the, the one Achilles heel of bonding technology uh, is that you're not absolutely guaranteed that it's going to work absolutely everywhere, um, which, um, you know, uh, certainly in 3G days um, was, uh, was, was a real issue. Um, so anything that um, ups the reliability and, and, and guaranteed bandwidth would clearly do that is going to be an attractive uh, proposition for broadcasters. Whether the price is right will be something else again. And uh, uh, technology, it's interesting because as the, as the bonding technology started to appear, um, I remember about two years ago, at IBC, I was suddenly introduced to the new spotter service, the, KA, the new KA Sat services, and it, it is interesting that now most of the bonding kit will just treat that as another IP source, mm. and so on. Um, I, I I could see the traditional vehicle-based outside broadcast crew starting to think about carrying KA Sat as their primary backhaul because once it's locked, you're 
you're, you've got some degree of quas there. Um, and then using bonding for, for infill. Uh, R Richard, can you... Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. The, 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 um, the 3G uh, bonding devices, we, you know, started off as a sort of a, a, an add-on, um, but certainly um, for us in Washington, D.C. now, it is the live content deliverer every day. And in fact, when we have hired local SNGs working SD and TSC, and then that, they've gone, why aren't we using the bonding device because the pictures are better? <laughs> and they are. That's um, and in, certainly in the UK, um, we now use uh, KA SAT vehicles, but they're actually using you know, one of the 3G, 4G bonding packs as the encoder. Right. It's 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 using the kit to its best ability, and uh, obviously a three G four G bonding device can be put on the back of a camera, used with SIMs, or you can go back to the vehicle, use it as the encoder. You know, if, if you've got no three G four G coverage, the vehicle will then give you the the pipe. Right. Um, and it, it it's all about um, speed of deployment, and it's a it's a cheaper resource than a fully fledged KUSNG truck. Mm -hmm. But it can also be an add-on. We've had the uh, KA dish next to a, a full-size multi-camera production vehicle, and the KA dish is actually providing internet access and newsroom content right. for the journalists while the truck is doing a, you know, the OB. The broadcast. So it, it's, it's the mixture of the two. I mean, it's, it's worth uh, mentioning Scotland, uh, the balance has shifted to, uh, to, to uh, actually we've got seven KA vehicles and only two KU. Um, actually, sorry, three, three KU vehicles, uh, one, one for radio. And you know, the availability of always on IP um, has, has changed the way we're able to work, whether that's going live or it's file based delivery. Um, you know, we're, we're able to do everything from the field. Our, uh, you know, our KA vehicles, our you know, edit vehicles on, on, on wheels that also can also go live. And I mean, uh, currently we are. We are able to manage th uh, things like rain fade by um, you know, booking, booking a bigger carrier, um, say a six meg carrier, and only doing a three meg live in there to, to, to allow for uh, you know, to, to allow for degradation um, in, in bandwidth availability. But we're re as Richard was saying, we, we're really now looking to move away from fixed bit rate to adaptive bit rate, which really allows us to get best best of both worlds, and we can actually also start thinking about um, uh, going live whilst. Uh, allowing people to access the internet and, and that, that's something that we, we, we've been testing a lot as, as well as looking to bond across uh, two separate KA providers to provide redundancy. I think um, you know, the ideal situation and one can see this happening more and more as um, availability of connectivity increases is to rock up on location and be able to suck up all the bandwidth that's there whether it comes off KA, whether it comes off cellular, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether, I mean whatever. Um, and essentially present that to the, the, the operator or present it to the journalist or whoever and say, that's connectivity, just use it. Um, and actually, they don't care where the connectivity is coming from. Uh, they don't care whether it's satellite, they don't care whether it's cellular, it's just connectivity and it allows them to do what they want to do. Um, and uh, it not only allows them to um, uh, you know, push stuff back to base, but it also allows them to essentially extend the newsroom out to the field. So all those production systems that, um, that they would normally use uh, back at base, they, can, they have available on their laptop. Um, so uh, the days when actually the poor bloody journalist um, standing at the live point was the last person to know what was actually happening and the guys back in the studio knew more because they could see the wires, actually that doesn't happen anymore or it shouldn't happen anymore. Um, the, the journalist you know, has access, should have access to the wires, to social media, for everything they want, right you know, in their hand. Mm. Um, and um, I think that's the sort of ideal situation we're all aiming for. So Mark, um, technology options in the core, um, this, this, a change at the edge often means a change at the core, not always. Um, with, you know, Colin's just mentioned adaptive bitrate, there's presumably got to be some degree of transcoding before you can introduce that that outside broadcast feed into the broadcast environment. Um, does that mean that you're having to introduce the MCR and the and the playouts and the technology in your core to a new stack of technology and a new set of workflows? Yeah, 
Maybe at the beginning where, where we have a, uh, the, the initial conversation, the coordination, we, obviously there, there's, there's all a, like a chain of people that get, that get uh, part of that uh, process to get the signal in. Um, but after that, w once it gets into the facility, and we're getting, we're getting signals uh, from, from various, various regions. So we have the, the small bureaus sending us content uh, we have the, the large, and we use one technology for that one. We have other technologies for when we have like larger bureaus where we have like permanent lines where we feed to them, feed back to, uh, to us. And, and then we have those kind of wild uh, mobile systems. The, the, uh, the going back to baseband to like HDSDI is, is kind of the, the, the common way to, uh, to make all these, all these signals from wherever they come into some sort of common standard. So we end up a lot with, uh, with signals that go to HDSDI and then they get recorded in, into our uh, house codec, into our system. So uh, apart from the coordination side, the, uh, the, uh, the handling of the live video ends up like all, all standardized within the, signal, the, within the, uh, the station or the, uh, the, the office where the signal is being received into a single standard. When we get to file base, well, that's that's also to get the benefit where when the reporter or the journalist comes back with the P2 card or those kind of things, then we uh, we reingest and and there's depending on the, the crew that uh, had sent that person, they will reingest in their editing system. But we we, we see we see just a, an easier and easier way to get those signals in now because we we try to kind of uh, standardize and have like. A, a, like workflows that are pre-established, and, uh, and apart from those wild situations, we uh, we try to stick to things that uh, we know and that people can react more efficiently, more rapidly into those situations. And um, as a sort of broad question: Do you get do you get uh, issues with matching with uh, metadata passing through the workflow? A sort of general question to all of you: If any of you want to pick it up. <laughs> Are there, are there uh, things that you've lost from the traditional broadcast workflow that if you were to ask the, uh, the Cellmux vendors to add that back in or to introduce that capability, uh, do any of you have capabilities which you, you feel would be I nice? I'd love to have something? tally right now. Tally. Okay, that's interesting. Are there other, uh, others, guys? <laughs> well, metadata um, in the field has never really been part of what of news acquisition metadata is more um, for moving content within the broadcast center so in the, you know in terms of 3g 4g bonding and IP delivery it's it it's not something that was there before yeah. so therefore you know it, mm -hmm. it's not something that you know that's we've missed sure um, I mean I think if anything it's improved mm. uh, our ability to use metadata because I mean you can actually you know attribute to you know, metadata to the file uh, I, yeah. I just send it whereas in the past, you, you, you couldn't send it, the piece of paper you're writing the metadata on uh, about your recording or, over the satellite. Um, for, for, you know, for example, you know, all of the information is there, and, and as Guy was saying, all of the information is coming back as well. I mean, we, we had a conversation a little while ago Colin, about, um, about the, workflow, the workflow integration in the field. I just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more about the fact that sometimes you need to actually have an external editing tool on a laptop or something to prepare content for push into your digital yeah. asset management and so on. Um, well, I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, the availability of IP connect connectivity means that we we're able to extend the newsroom out, out to the field, um, and you know, we're, as well as deliver, we're able to pull content uh, from our uh, from our, uh, you know, our, our video library um, and, and actually edit that in the field uh, after it's been downloaded, you know, it, it, on our uh, our MacBook or, or, or whatever we're using to you know, have it, uh, edit machine, and you know, integrate that material into into the content in in broadcast quality. And then we deliver it um, in broadcast quality, albeit um, we, 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 depending on the immediacy of of, of this news story, uh, we may do some transcoding uh, to, uh, you know, to to be able to f file send much quicker than we would uh, uh, norm normally do. But uh, as 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 Mark was saying earlier, you know, we're able to you know do things live or you know quick hits and low quality and replace it with the the full fat uh, version at a later time. I think, um, yeah, I, th I certainly wouldn't want to encourage any vendor to make um, things more difficult on location. Um, metadata, you know, the metadata can be automatically uh, provided, um, you know, uh, and, and, and come as part of the file. 
uh, then that's fine. I mean, people, you know, camera crews and operators generally on location hate having to fill in boxes. Um, and sometimes they have to, but um, they hate having to do it. And if they can possibly avoid it, they won't do it. Um, so, um, you know, mm. I, I just don't think there's, there's much point in, in, in pushing for that. I mean, something as simple as GPS coordinates and time of day have, have changed yeah. changed things mm. dramatically. Yeah. Because um, mm. everything is date stamped yeah. um, from the location. And you've got the GPS coordinates. So it's actually easier to track right. what file came in when yeah. than if it had been <coughs> fed the traditional method. Right, it's coming in blind. Um, I think one of the, thing, one of the, one of the points I hinted at is... is the change of workflow for MCR, for the MCR, the, the hub end, has been the biggest change in all of this. Um, because most of the 3G, 4G bonding backpacks and camera back units now, what we encourage is we encourage the cameramen to actually just concentrate on what they do and leave the MCR to deal with the technology. Right. Because they could, once it's connected and you have a connection, it can all be remotely controlled from, from the MCR. So it's put far more emphasis on the quality control and the, the technical aspects back into the hub end and it leaves the cameraman to concentrate on what he actually needs to do which is shoot the material. Right. So we've we've had a couple of um, vendors in the last couple press releases through so much in the last couple of weeks about vendors that are um, starting to release their muxing capability for software environments so that you could build your own application on a laptop. I'm just wondering whether that might be something that's going to, you, you think that's going to be sort of broad question, but do you think that's something that's going to be uh, exciting uh, in the environment or is that actually sort of, it sounds a little bit like that might be pushing the wrong way actually. You, you mean building our own uh, bonding unit? Well, um, certainly, uh, I'm not going to name the vendors at the moment, but a cu couple of the guys are, are uh, you're able to now build your own encoding application on a laptop and yeah. have two USB dongles and effectively mux that link together or you know use the Ethernet port as well um, and uh, which bypasses the need for the pre-manufactured device. I think um, that might work if you're uploading you know ed content you're editing on a laptop but actually the uh, and, and, and we will do that um, mm. and, and so the ability to, to maybe um, increase your connectivity off a laptop might be something that people will be grateful for. Um, however um, Generally, a laptop is not a very good live tool unless you're not moving around. I mean, the good thing about uh, a lot of the technology that we currently, uh, we're, we're now playing with, is that you can you can grab it and run down the road with it, yeah. or you can drive down the road with it really, really, really Drive easily. over it in some uh, cases. Or, or yes. even even better, you can um, you can transmit while you're on the move. I mean, one of the one of the USPs, if you like, of um, a three and four G is that it's a mobile technology. So you know. You can you can go live from from your car. Um, that, uh, you know you can go live from a boat. You can go live from a train. I mean, you know Colin was talking earlier about the Queen's Baton relay. Um, you know that is essentially what the, the coverage of that is mobile. I mean it's a relay. It's moving all the time. And and it was the same uh, for the um, the Olympic torch relay. Uh, you know a couple of years before. Um, you know, I can't remember, it was 7,000 miles around the UK, was it? it was um, and, and nearly all of it was live. Well, you know, that's because the technology is a live technology. That's absolutely it's beautifully segued into my last, the last <laughs> section before we take some Q&A. Um, for the creatives watching, the non-techies, uh, the producers, the, the, the content designers, I wanted to just have a little chat about exactly what you're talking about, the, the new types of shots, the new, the new uh, creative uh, potential that this technology enables. Um, Mark, that might be less relevant for you, but I'm going to start with you. I d do you see in the news gathering space new types of news, uh, new types of news footage being enabled? Is that for the creatives in the audience here? Um, in, in, what do you see the, the cellular technology enabling? There's certainly a time where you you uh, you appreciate the uh, the ease of use and the uh, how how lightweight and how mobile you become. Uh, in New York City, for example, you handling a truck and finding line of sight for a satellite, uh, getting uh, getting parking permission, those kind of things 
are, are things of the past. Like you, you, you go in and, and what? You get towed. So, so, so those, those kind of things, when you, when you had to live through those type of situations, you, you look at today's technology and you say, well, no, you're on the go. You can cover. You can be at any place. There's no like, oh, I need to be right here. And then you, you carry a, a 200 feet coax uh, to, uh, to uh, the location where you want to be. You, uh, you're, you can be in a building. You can move uh, through an elevator. You could, you could put a, a, a little kit by the window and still be able to, uh, to get a signal to be transmitting live. The, the versatility, the, the flexibility, and then we mentioned cars and boats and trains. Like, that, that gives the, the creative people the, the, the flexibility of the type of shots that they, they, they could only dream of in an in a OB van type of situation. So we see them basically asking for more. So, but don't they all always ask for more? But that's, that's okay. But now some, some, uh, some more time than others, we could say yes. Um. Guys, have you, have you got favourite moments that you've seen captured by cell marks that you could have never seen earlier in your career? It's, um, it has changed what we do dramatically. And yeah, absolutely right. They, they, trying to, it, it could be New York, Washington, London, Paris. Any major city has big issues parking. I mean, we <laughs> still uh, use microwave, digital microwave, mm -hmm. because it's still a very useful tool, certainly in central London. But the 3G, 4G has changed a lot of that now. To another cost saving and parking fines. <laughs> well, it, it, I mean, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, it would be part of the trap. Where it's the only place we can park. We're going to take a ticket, you know, and it's, you take the ticket. I hope they don't Every time. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, um, the, the other thing uh, worth t uh, mentioning is that. Um, uh, well, the other advantage of IP is that it is essentially multi. It's a multimedia tool. I mean, before when we're back in the in the, in the old days, you know, an SNG did telly, and you had a separate vehicle to do radio, and yeah. Uh, now, actually, you can you can do the whole lot of one vehicle, uh, which. Um, if you're trying to run a, a multimedia operation uh, the way, for example, the BBC is, um, you know, where you're asking a, a journalist to walk across, work across TV, radio, and online, um, the fact that they, they they can be editing their TV package, they can step outside and do a TV live or do a radio live using the connectivity, you know, the KASAT connectivity or even the KU uh, the KU IP connectivity, um, and and also you know uh, work on text and essentially have everything on their laptop, it makes it a very flexible tool uh, in a way that you just didn't have, you know, six or seven years ago. Okay, let's take a, we've got about um, five, six minutes left. Are there any questions from the floor um, uh, that you'd like to ask us? Peter. Can you say a bit more about using your iPhone in the app? I'm just going to repeat that for the webcasters. So the questions are, can you talk a, bit, a little bit more about using an iPhone uh, uh, for, for in this context? Um, yeah, I mean, all the major vendors either have or are about to launch um, either iPhone apps or Android apps and basically um, use the iPhone uh, 3G, 4G connectivity to stream back but directly to base over the mobile network. So mm -hmm. it means that um, certainly with Sky, all of our reporters have a phone that's capable of sending pictures back to Sky directly. Um, I think it, yeah I think there's a you know number of uh, organizations are embracing this whole idea of mobile journalism which uh, mojo um, which um, essentially you know you use a, a smartphone or an iPad but probably a smartphone um, to to do everything from shooting to editing to going live um, and it's a, it's a, it's not a way of working that suits everybody and it won't suit every story but um, it's certainly, you know, uh, broadcasters like RTE, for example, in Ireland are, um, are making some pretty good use of that uh, way of working, and it's all off smartphones. I mean, we, 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 uh, all of our news journalists have, have uh, smartphones now, um, and they're able to go uh, live into radio um, using uh, voice over IP style apps. Um, you know, we're able to go live over, over video. Um, we, we've seen, seen the point where um, actually uh, you know, an iPhone can compete with a, uh, well, an, an iPhone. Uh, with the Good Bonding app can compete with uh, an SDSNG truck. I mean, I, I've had conversations with colleagues where uh, we, we, we've done live tests mm. and they've asked what truck we've used. I mean, it is, it's, it's really changing, changing the way that you know, our, 
our journalists are able to respond, uh, and the first responders are able to respond to, 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 to news, and also uh, you know, getting into uh, you know, into situations where we would never be able, be able to go live otherwise. You know, for, for example, uh, you know, lives during uh, during floods. I mean, Richard was showing us a, a nice live video uh, from a boat that wouldn't have been possible in any other way. Um, I mean, but it's, it's also um, you know, having a smartphone. They, they've all got better cameras than um, than most of our. Uh, you know, SLRs are, are um, now, um, and um, you know, um, being able to uh, shoot short form uh, video clips and file them um, um, almost immediately um, is, is a game changer. I mean, uh, I remember, I uh, was it last year? Um, um, it was the Pope's uh, inauguration. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was an example of, of that. I mean, um, there was uh, there was there was, a, there was a clip of the nuns running to get receipts. Which we would never be able to have got out um, and turned around mm -hmm. if we, if our journalists hadn't been uh, canny enough to, to use their iPhone to do that. And I think also it's the the nature of the of broadcasting is changing, isn't it? I mean the the, the online um, competition, if you like, is is really fierce. And and um, essentially, you a broadcaster or any media organisation are live and die by their content. And if you're able to exploit smartphones or uh, similar tools to get content back from as wide a range of locations featuring as wide a, a, a number of news lines as you possibly can in an affordable way then you stand a much better chance of surviving in the new environment and, and I think this technology um, is, is, is pretty vital if you want to compete in that area because you know you're only as good as your content and you're only as good as your ability to get that content somewhere where people can see it and a smartphone can do that for you. Mark, are you seeing uh, seeing uptake of the iPhone and smartphone in the uh, in the news environment? Oh, yeah, definitely, the, uh, the, the those those systems or those little cameras, essentially. I mean, they're everywhere. Everybody has one or two or three. So, uh, the, I've seen a lot of nice development in terms of live shooting. Obviously, the, the brackets, how you hold those phones, have always been an issue. But now you can have a lot of the rigs that basically help you go along, walk around, and, and with the, with your phone, it, it will look professional because you don't have the jerkiness of the uh, of that movement that is normally associated with the with the small uh, cameras or like like the phones or iPhone or Android. I mean, and we've 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 gone through the the uh, the other part where the. The, the personalities, the, the politicians, the people you get into that you interview, and they, they would look at you at the beginning. But three, four years ago, we could still feel those kind of situations where if you if you came in front of them with a little iPhone, they wouldn't give you the time of day. It, 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 that was not like seen as professional. But now this, these cameras are so widely distributed that anybody can have one, and, and now they use it either to record sound or to record a full audiovisual uh, from uh, from those interviews. And you, you have to you have to take that content. You have to embrace that technology is going to go many more miles, and we probably haven't seen the end of that one. So uh, as as a content. Uh, Aggregator or, or broadcaster or distributor, it, there's no there's no way you can say no to that type of technology. And, and in years from now, you'll say, "Wow, th this this has gone a long way, and we're we're happy we did that. We we followed that technology and we kept up with it." So I've just got one uh, one last question in the last two minutes, and you can you can answer this yes or no. Has anyone done a live shoot using a, a bonding technology from an aeroplane? Not a helicopter or a balloon, but from an aeroplane. I think it's happened in the in States, the but the CAA would probably... I'm not sure what the regulations are on it. Yeah, um, they, you know, they don't tend to like you using any kind of uh, SIM-powered device. And in, fact, in fact, quite a few of the manufacturers actually um, state categorically you cannot use their devices in a plane. Okay, so I'll go back to my questions. Has anyone actually made a shot from a plane here? <laughs> You can answer no. <laughs> no, we've, we've, we've certainly never done it. I've, I've seen video of it being done, uh, having been done in a very old aircraft in the States, but, but um, it's so not a fly-by-wire aircraft. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah. And equally the problem is, as soon as you... I mean, all of the 3G, 4G cell towers are all aimed at the ground. Yeah. So literally, as soon as you get up... I mean, we, we tried to do a, uh, a live a few weeks back from a hot air balloon. The takeoff and up to about 500 feet was brilliant. After that, interesting. <laughs> that was the end of the 
the connectivity because they they literally up to a thousand feet and you're out of three G four G range. Right. Well, listen. Uh, oh, so Oliver does a live show with British Airways on a plane. Does he? How's he yeah. got CIA he's probably, approval? He's probably using Wi-Fi on the the Wi-Fi antenna class. on the aircraft. Oh, yeah, yeah. First no, class, I mean, of course. <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. You can, um, yeah, you can. You, you, you can do it with you, that. You can do it with the uh, um, the guys. Uh, Satellite. Who went to NAB um, last year? Um, did some Skype calls um, mid Atlantic right. using the onboard Wi Fi. Right. Well, so yeah. it's, you know, it's That's not, you know, it's, everything's possible. Everything's possible. Just depends yeah. on how much it's going to cost. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, guys, Colin, Richard, uh, Guy, Mark, I, I couldn't thank you enough for helping us kick off sellmarks.com in this way. Um, streaming media forum as well. Thank you for uh, for allowing us to be your diamond sponsor. And to this audience, it's been uh, this has been a great session. Actually, I'm really pleased. So, thanks once again. Join us for a tea or a coffee or an ice cream if uh, if you're feeling the heat like I am. And uh, we'll see you online very soon. Thank you.